Welcome to Campus Conversations with the President. I'm here today with Melissa Kane, our centennial historian. As you can see, no, she's not really 100 <laughs> years old. But Melissa's been really doing an extraordinary job of bringing alive, really, the, the history of our university. And of course, we've heard so much as we celebrate the centennial about the founding of the university and the great ceremonies and, and all that President Lovett did to help launch this university. But I'd like to focus a little bit on about 50 years later, you know, as we celebrate our semi-centennial together with the inauguration of President Kenneth Pitzer. Uh, and I think it's generally acknowledged that President Pitzer had a huge effect on Rice University. So what was President Pitzer coming into? What, what had the university sort of looked like in the years preceding his arrival? Well, in the years after Lovett, um, when William Houston was president of, of, uh, of the Institute, um, he was brought in uh, in order to move us forward um, towards becoming a, a real university. He was a very accomplished physicist, uh, world famous actually, came from Caltech, and he knew what a real university was supposed to look like. And he made actually some fine strides in that area for the very first time when um, Houston came, the, the general announcements were rewritten uh, to include the emphasis on graduate studies and, and on research. So we were already moving in that direction when Pitzer, when Pitzer arrived on campus in, in 1961. Um, and he was tasked with, very specifically, by, by George Brown and the rest of the Rice Board, with moving Rice dramatically forward. That's interesting. So the, the Rice Board had kind of maintained this sense of ambition over time? You know, there had been, you know, whenever there's lifetime trustees, there are people who serve very long terms. But after the end of World War II, there had been, for the first time, really a very large generational turnover on the board. And that included many people who were up and coming in the Houston business community. George Brown, of course, was already, was already there. Um, but other people like, like uh, Gus Wortham, Newton Razor, they were very ambitious for, for the institution and, and very uh, you know, specifically went out to try to find a president who had the tools to move us forward in a, in a very, very significant way. So what would you say was the status of Rice University? Of course, we didn't have rankings back then. Rice was not a member of the Association of American Universities. How was Rice perceived in the nation at that time? Well, I think there's, there's um, plenty of evidence of how it was perceived, and that was as a very, very good regional university, basically technical and scientific in, in what it what it focused on, um, but it was not at all on on the radar as a as a nationally important um, research institution. So, how does uh, President Pitzer then go about deciding what he's going to do and, and embarking upon this job? And I I, I love President Pitzer. Um, he he part of the reason he was chosen was because he had served for many years as on the Atomic Energy Commission, sort of as their liaison between uh, their, their grant-making people and the universities. So not only was he a fine chemist who had ties all through the scientific establishment because of that, but he also knew how federal grant-making really worked. And that was an area that we had not aggressively exploited up until that point, and he set out to aggressively exploit it. We had had maybe was it a couple of naval grants or something before. We had yeah, there were there were a ha there were a handful of grants from the Navy, <coughs> and um, we had also the grants that funded the Van de Graaff accelerators for the physics department. So it isn't that there was nothing happening; it's that there had been no intentional and sustained institutional focus on going out and getting that source of funding. The other thing he did was he went about getting funding in a much more direct way. Um, and that was to organize and carry out our very first capital campaign. What, what was the total amount of that campaign? $33 million was the announced, uh, was the announced goal. 
and um, it was, you know, very carefully planned and the money was spread out for very specific projects and we actually had no trouble making it and in fact I think the, the, the total raised was over 40 million dollars. And did he have to go through an elaborate process with the faculty, with the board? What was the, you know, during his time I think the university was expanded by 50 percent, a substantial expansion of the faculty, obviously all that required not only a lot of resources, but uh, for some people, I assume, a different way of about thinking about the university. Oh, yes. No, he definitely ruffled a lot of feathers. Um, he, he came in here, and he was an outsider. He was from California, of all places. Um, and although he was, um, he was a scientist, maybe because he was a scientist, he, <laughs> he was not um, the warmest personality. And um, so there was a... We have a, some very warm scientists. Today. I know, I, that, yes, uh, I can list them for you. Um, he... I want to say there are too many to list. <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, he ruffled a lot of feathers. A lot of people were upset with him. It was not the traditional way that things had been done here, which was very closed. Um, you know, when we had to do fundraising, we did it from a small group of people who were already deeply invested in the institution. So the idea of going out and asking outsiders for funding did not come easily. The idea of dramatically expanding the student body, dramatically expanding the faculty was, was upsetting to you know, a significant portion of the community. And he's here at the end about is it eight or nine years? Nine years. And so when he leaves, has he achieved those goals he set out? He had achieved a, a, you know, a startling amount of it. Um, you, you know as well as I do how hard it is to, to make things change on a, on a university campus. Um, no matter what it is you want to do, there's always someone who's going who's gonna to protest. But by the time Pitzer left, he had raised all that money the amount of federal grants coming in had skyrocketed. We had desegregated. We won a lawsuit to begin charging tuition, which money we badly needed to fund all these improvements. The size of the faculty had doubled. The size of the student body had, had gone up by probably 45, 50 percent. Um, and, and we had helped send people to the moon. So that first decade following our semi-centennial becomes really a kind of renewed push for the university in the aspiration, achieving the aspirations that President Lovett had laid out at the beginning. It was a breakthrough decade. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Melissa, for being here with us thank today. You. Thank you for joining us for this campus conversation. We hope to visit with you again when we learn more about Rice and the extraordinary people who make up our community. Thank you.